This is Catherine from Accelerated Reader. Today I will be reading Unit 4, Lesson 19, Harvesting Hope, the story of Cesar Chavez. As a boy, Cesar Chavez lived on his family's big ranch in Arizona. His family had a big house and all the food they could want. Cesar loved to play with his cousins and his brother Richard. He liked to listen to his relatives' tales of the life back in Mexico. Then, in 1937, the summer Cesar was 10, the trees around the ranch began to wilt. The sun baked the farm soil rock hard. A drought was choking the life out of Arizona. Without water for the crops, the Chavez family couldn't make money to pay its bills. There came a day when Cesar's mother couldn't stop crying. In a daze, Cesar watched his father strap their possessions onto the roof of their old car. After a long struggle, the family no longer owned the ranch. They had no choice but to join the hundreds of thousands of people fleeing to the green valleys of California to look for work. Cesar's old life had vanished. Now he and his family were migrants, working on other people's farms, crisscrossing California, picking whatever fruits and vegetables were in season. When the Chavez family arrived at the first of their new homes in California, they found a battered old shed. Its doors were missing and garbage covered the dirt floor. Cold, damp air seeped into their bedding and clothes. They shared water and outdoor toilets with a dozen other families. An overcrowding made everything filthy. The neighbors were constantly fighting and the noise upset Cesar. He had no place to play games with Richard. Meals were sometimes made of dandelion greens gathered along the road. Cesar swallowed his bitter homesickness and worked alongside his family. He was small and not very strong, but still a fierce worker. Nearly every crop caused torment. Yanking out beets broke the skin between his thumb and index finger. Grapevines sprayed with bug-killing chemicals made his eyes sting and his lungs wheeze. Lettuce had to be the worst. Thinning lettuce all day with a short-handled hoe would make hot spasms shoot through his back. Farm chores on someone else's farm instead of on his own felt like a form of slavery. The Chavez family talked con constantly of saving enough money to buy back their ranch. But by each sundown, the whole family had earned as little as 30 cents for the day's work. As the years blurred together, they spoke of the ranch less and less. The towns weren't much better than the fields. White trade only signs were displayed in many stores and restaurants. None of the 35 schools Sassad attended over the years seemed like a safe place either. Once, after Sassad broke the rule about speaking English at all times, a teacher hung a sign on him that read, I am a clown. I speak Spanish. He came to hate school because of the conflicts, though he liked to learn. Even he considered his eighth grade graduation a miracle. After eighth grade, he dropped out to work in the fields full time. His lack of schooling embarrassed Cesar for the rest of his life, but as a teenager, he just wanted to put food on his family's table. As he worked, it disturbed him that landowners 
treated their workers more like farm tools than human beings. They provided no clean drinking water, rest periods, or access to bathrooms. Anyone who complained was fired, beaten up, or sometimes even murdered. So, like other migrant workers, Cesar was afraid and suspicious whenever outsiders show, showed up to try to help. How could they know about feeling so powerless? Who could battle such odds? Yet, Cesar had never forgotten his old life in Arizona and the jolt he'd felt when it was turned upside down. Farm work did not have to be this miserable. Reluctantly, he started paying attention to the outsiders. He began to think that maybe there was hope. And in his early 20s, he decided to dedicate the rest of his life to fighting for change. Again, he crisscrossed California, this time to talk to people into joining his fight. At first, out of every hundred workers he talked to, perhaps one would agree with him. One by one, this was how he started. At the first meeting Cesar organized, a dozen women gathered. He sat quietly in a corner. After 20 minutes, everyone started wondering when the organizer would show up. Cesar thought he might die of embarrassment. Well, I'm the organizer, he said, and forced himself to keep talking, hoping to inspire respect with his new suit and the mustache he was trying to grow. The women listened politely, and he was sure they did so out of pity. But despite his shyness, Cesar showed a knack for solving problems. People trusted him. With workers, he was endlessly patient and compassionate. With landowners, he was stubborn, demanding, and single-minded. He was learning to be a fighter. In a fight for justice, he told everyone truth was a better weapon than violence. Nonviolence, he said, takes more guts. It meant using imagination to find ways to overcome powerlessness. More and more people listened. One night, 150 people poured into an old abandoned theater in Fresno. At this first meeting of the National Farm Workers Association, Cesar unveiled its flag, a bold black eagle, the sacred bird of the Aztec Indians. La Cosa, the Cots, was born. It was time to rebel, and the place was Delano. Here in the heart of the lush San Joaquin Valley, brilliant green vineyards reached toward every horizon. Poorly paid workers hunched over grapevines for most of each year. Then, in 1965, the vineyard owners cut their pay even further. Cesar chose to fight just one of the 40 landowners, hopeful that others would get the message. As plump grapes dropped, thousands of workers walked off the company's fields in a strike. Or, Welga. Grapes, when ripe, do not last long. The company fought back with everything from punches to bullets. Sassad refused to respond with violence. Violence would only hurt La Cuasa. Instead, he organized a march, a march of more than 300 miles. He and his supporters would walk from Delano to the state capital in Sacramento to ask for the government's help. Sassad and 67 others started out one morning. Their first obstacle was the Delano police force, 30 of whose members locked arms to prevent the group from crossing the street. After three hours of arguing in public, the chief of police backed down. Joyous marchers 
headed north under the sizzling sun. Their rallying cry was, Si se puede, or, Yes, it can be done. The first night they reached Ducor. The marchers slept outside the tiny cabin of the only person who would welcome them. Single file they continued, covering an average of 15 miles a day. They inched their way through the San Joaquin Valley, while the unharvested grapes in Deleno turned white with mold. Sassad developed plain, painful blisters right away, and he and many others had blood seeping out of their shoes. The word spread. Along the way, farm workers offered food and drink as the marchers passed by. When the sun set, marchers lit candles and kept going. Shelter was no longer a problem. Supporters began welcoming them each night with feasts. Every night was a rally. Our pilgrimage is the match, one speaker shouted, that will light our cause for all farm workers to see what is happening here. Eager supporters would keep the marchers up half the night talking about change. Every morning, the line of marchers swelled, Sassad always in the lead. On the ninth day, hundreds marched through Fresno. The long, peaceful march was a shock to people unaware of how California farm workers had to live. Now students, public officials, religious leaders, and citizens from everywhere offered help. For the great company, the publicity was becoming unbearable. And on the vines, the grapes continued to rot. In Modesto, on the 15th day, an exhilarated crowd celebrated Sassad's 38th birthday. Two days later, 5,000 people met the marchers in Stockton with flowers, guitars, and accordions. That evening, Sassad received a message that he was sure was a prank. But in case it was true, he left the march and had someone drive him all through the night to a mansion in wealthy Beverly Hills. Officials from the grape company were waiting for him. They were ready to recognize the authority of the National Farm Workers Association, promising a contract with a pay raise and better conditions. Sassad rushed back to join the march. On Easter Sunday, when the marchers arrived in Sacramento, the parade was 10,000 people strong. From the steps of the state capitol building, the joyous announcement was made to the public. Sassad Chavez had just signed the first contract for farm workers in American history. The end.